Ah, welcome. Warm yourself by the fire. Have a seat or snuggle up in your favorite spot and let me tell you a story. The Last Letter Written Researched And Narrated By Me As he looked up through the billowing smoke of the battlefield, with blurred vision and ringing in his ears, he could glimpse the blue and partially clouded sky, feel the heat and humidity of the day, and the choking pangs of ever-increasing thirst. The shell fragments had done their work. He knew that death was coming to claim its prize. Jeremiah Gage, Jerry to his friends, was born near Richland, Mississippi on March 9, 1840, into a wealthy plantation family. He'd had all the afforded opportunities of life and education. By the time Jeremiah was ten years old, he could read and write Latin and Greek, and was purportedly a favored student. Due to his hard work and studious nature, Jeremiah was enrolled into the University of Mississippi at age 16 and quickly found his stride in the world of higher academia. His scholastic competitiveness, physical stature, blue eyes and strawberry blonde hair made him a favorite and striking figure. Jeremiah's letters home may seem familiar and similar of students today. Complaints of studying, needing money, and worries about grades and class placement. But not all was hard work and no play for Jeremiah. A local Oxford Southern Belle and daughter of well-to-do merchant Thomas Wendell, by the name of Mary Wendell, Molly to her friends, had ensnared the heart of Jeremiah. By the time of his graduation in June of 1860, Jeremiah had asked Mary's father for her hand in marriage and had planned on marrying her after law school. All of his hard work and plans for a future with Mary were coming true, or so he thought. However, life does not always work that way. Best laid plans of mice and men, you know. By May of 1861, Ole Miss had suspended classes, and Jeremiah, caught up in the fervor and romance of war, did not want to miss his opportunity to fight the foreign invaders and oppression of the North, as many saw and felt. After being mustered in with the majority of his fellow students in Lynchburg, Virginia, he marched off to war as Private Jeremiah Gage, Company A, 11th Mississippi Infantry Regiment, the University Greys. By August of 1861, Mary had had a change of heart and wrote to Jeremiah, expressing a desire to put their engagement on hold. But Jeremiah was determined to see his life through with Mary. On July 27, 1862, Jeremiah had been wounded at the Battle of Gaines Mill and soon found himself once again walking with Mary during his medical leave and recovery. Assurances made and promises rekindled, Plans were once again set in motion for Jeremiah and Mary. Several letters were sent back and forth, and the ever-increasing strains on their relationship and the weariness of war also became evident. Like so many others, now First Sergeant Jeremiah Gage found himself in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The weather had steadily increased in its heat and humidity since July 1st, and now... On July 3, 1863, the 11th Mississippi Regiment of Joe Davis's brigade found itself poised on the precipice of Pickett's Charge and Eternity. Early in the morning, the medical corps had set up a field station in the defilade of McMillan's woods behind the Confederate artillery, and there awaited the inevitable onslaught of casualties. Just before the opening salvo of Confederate artillery, men were told to go to ground, to lay down. While there may be some discrepancies, depending on sources, 
at approximately 1 to 1.07 p.m. Two signal guns opened fire from the Peach Orchard, and thus began the largest ever artillery bombardment on U.S. soil. Some sources say the sound and concussion of the guns were heard and felt 40 miles away or more. Men laying on the ground were said to remark how the leaves floated in the air from the sustained cannon and shell fire. Now, sending artillery in the direction of your enemy has a tendency to annoy them and stimulate a response. First Lieutenant Featherstone was reported to have been standing amongst his men, had just put on a pair of gloves while stating a wish to face them with gloves on, when a Union shell bounced off the ground in front of him, centered towards his chest, and then exploded. His shattered body was described as having flipped through the air like a rag doll and came down in pieces some 20 to 30 yards away. The returning fire from the Union lines was so terrible that many of the casualties suffered on that day were before Pickett's charge even stepped off nearly two hours later. Dr. Joseph Holt, attending at the field station, went on to describe the ensuing scene that would forever remain in his clarity. The first to arrive, born on a litter, was a princely fellow and favored son of the 11th Mississippi. I saw in an instant a condition of terrible shock. Keeping everyone close to the ground, I turned to him, and he pointed to his left arm. I quickly exposed it and found that a cannonball had nearly torn it away between the shoulder and the elbow. I made some encouraging remark when he smiled and said, Why, doctor, that is nothing. Here's where I'm really hurt. And he laid back the blanket and exposed the lower abdomen, torn from left to right by a cannon shot, largely carrying away the bladder with much intestine and one-third of the right half of the pelvis. But in both wounds, so grinding and twisting the tissues, that there were no hemorrhage. I surveyed his personality, observing the tender devotion on the part of his litter-bearers, and I saw a singularly attractive creature. Through his deathly pallor, I could detect a sunburned blonde who, in health, would show a strong and ruddy countenance, a large head with a tousled stock of reddish golden locks, like a mane, with the muscularity and form of an athlete. Without the slightest change of voice, he asked, Doctor, how long have I to live? A very few hours, I replied. Doctor, I am in great agony. Let me die easy, dear doctor. I, I would do the same for you. His soul peered from the depths of his blue eyes in an appeal of anguish that cut me to the heart, and I replied, You dear, noble fellow, I will see to it that you shall die easy. No word or detail of this scene has faded from my memory. There was no thought of the dramatic. It was dreadfully genuinely and naturally spontaneous, and the unconscious creating an act of a grander tragedy than we might ever hope to play. For my own feelings, and as a physician, I could make no disclosure of his name and tell this reminiscence. I called for, and my hospital knapsack bearer Jim Roll quickly handed me a two-ounce bottle of Black Drop, which is a concentrated solution of opium much stronger than laudanum. I poured a tablespoon full of it into a tin cup with a little water and offered it to him. But before this hand could reach it, a thought flashed in my mind and withdrawing the cup I asked, Have you no message to leave? It startled him, and in a low, moaning wail he cried, My mother, oh, my darling mother, how could I have forgot you? Quick, I want to write. By this time, all who were crouching under the low shelter were crowded around, oblivious of their own injuries and weeping silently. I took my seat on the ground, close beside him, and I lifted him over, reclining on my chest, his 
face close to mine to steady his head, his right elbow in the hollow of my right hand to support and steady his arm, and we slipped a pencil into his hand. Jim Roll had provided the sheet of paper, held on the smooth lid of a hospital knapsack, improvised as a desk. He wrote rapidly, and all of this transpired in haste, murmuring to himself the words audible to me, for I looked the other way. He began with place and date. On the battlefield, July 3rd. He wrote little more than half a page, into which he poured with vehemence, his whole soul of tenderest love, never faltering for a word, and a message toward the last, with a name he wrote silently, and conscious of the presence of strangers. But the message was too personal and sacred to him for me to trespass, for it was holy ground. The last line he softly repeated aloud, I dip this letter in my dying blood. With that, he turned down the blanket, and seizing the letter, pressed the back of it upon his oozing bloody wound, and handed it to me, giving his mother's address and begging to be sure that she got that letter. I arose from the ground and had him supported when he turned to me with a reminder of my promise and of his hopeless pain. I handed him the cup, and he feebly waved it, saying, Come around, boys, and let us have a toast. I do not invite you to drink with me but I drink the toast to you and to the Southern Confederacy and to victory. And he grabbed it to the last drop, returning the cup, saying, I thank you. We laid him back down on some improvised soft headrest, and I rushed off to work amongst the wounded. In about an hour, passing hastily, I lifted the cover from his face to find him sleeping painlessly. Three hours later, as the tide of battle turned and the Southern Confederacy had touched its high water mark, an ebb tide began. I passed again and laid aside the cover from his face to find that the spirit of our reincarnated Sir Galahad had taken its flight in triumphal ascension. Upon the receding wave of the great charge came a heavy drift of shattered humanity. Jeremiah Gage's final words were written as follows. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, July 3rd. My dear mother, this is the last you may hear from me. I have time to tell you that I died like a man. Bear my loss as best you can. Remember that I am true to my country and my greatest regret at dying is that she is not free and that you and my sisters are robbed of my worth, whatever that may be. I hope this will reach you, and you must not regret that my body cannot be obtained. It is a mere matter of form anyhow. This is for my sisters too, as I cannot write more. Send my dying release to Miss Mary. You know who. Signed J.S. Gage, Company A, 11th Mississippi. Addressed to Mrs. P.W. Gage, Richland, Holmes County, Mississippi. With a postscript. This letter is stained with my blood. While sources can vary and misunderstandings occur, from what I have learned, Jeremiah Gage's letter made it home. But upon seeing the blood-stained letter, his mother tucked it away, never having read his final words. July 3rd, 1863, saw the decimation of Company A, the University Grays, with 100% casualties. The remnants of those that survived were folded into Company G. 
Jeremiah Gage is merely one story amongst tens of thousands whose ripple in the torrent of war washed over every corner and life in the young country. Blue or gray, yank or reb, these were fathers, husbands, sons, and brothers. Their blood ran red. They loved and were loved, felt happiness and pain. It's easy to look at black and white photographs and forget the world that they saw, its brilliant colors, the feeling of a soft breeze upon their face, and the dreams had and lost. Each story deserves to be told and needs to be remembered. For good or bad, these were Americans, and not as far removed in history as we might think lest we forget, so as not to repeat. If you like these stories, please subscribe, like and share, and don't forget to hit that notification bell for future stories. And as always, I thank you from the bottom of my heart to take the time to listen. The End